Chapter Two, Part Two of A Group of Noble Dames by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Dame the Second, Barbara of the House of Grebe by the Old Surgeon, Part Two. The hours went past, and there was a dead silence in and round about Usholt Lodge, except for the sighing of the trees till, when it was near upon midnight, she heard the noise of hooves and wheels approaching the door. Knowing that it could only be her husband, Barbara instantly went into the hall to meet him. Yet she stood there not without a sensation of faintness, so many were the changes since their parting. And owing to her casual encounter with Lord Upland Towers, his voice and image still remained with her, excluding Edmund, her husband, from the inner circle of her impressions. But she went to the door, and the next moment a figure stepped inside, of which she knew the outline, but little besides. Her husband was attired in a flapping black cloak and a slouched hat, appearing altogether as a foreigner, and not as the young English burgess who had left her side. When he came forward into the light of the lamp, she perceived with surprise, and almost with fright, that he wore a mask. At first she had not noticed this, there being nothing in the colour which would lead a casual observer to think he was looking on anything but a real countenance. He must have seen her start of dismay at the unexpectedness of his appearance, for he said hastily, "'I did not mean to come into you like this. I thought you would have been in bed. How good you are, dear Barbara!' He put his arm round her, but he did not attempt to kiss her. "'Oh, Edmund, it is you. It must be.' she said, with clasped hands, for though his figure and movement were almost enough to prove it, and the tones were not unlike his old tones, the enunciation was so altered as to seem that of a stranger. "'I am covered like this to hide myself from the curious eyes of the inn-servants and others,' he said in a low voice. "'I will send back the carriage and join you in a moment. "'You are quite alone?' "'Quite. My companion stopped at Southampton.' The wheels of the post-chaise rolled away as she entered the dining-room, where the supper was spread, and presently he rejoined her there. He had removed his cloak and hat, but the mask was still retained, and she could now see that it was of a special make, of some flexible material like silk, coloured so as to represent flesh, and it joined naturally to the front hair, and was otherwise cleverly executed. "'Barbara, you look ill.' he said, removing his glove and taking her hand. "'Yes, I have been ill,' said she. "'Is this pretty little house ours?' "'Oh, yes.' She was hardly conscious of her words, for the hand he had ungloved in order to take hers was contorted, and had one or two of its fingers missing, while through the mask she discerned the twinkle of one eye only. "'I would give anything to kiss you, dearest. Now, at this moment,' he continued, with mournful passionateness. But I cannot, in this guise. The servants are abed, I suppose. Yes, said she. But I can call them. You will have some supper? He said he would have some, but that it was not necessary to call anybody at that hour. Thereupon they approached the table and sat down, facing each other. Despite Barbara's scared state of mind, it was forced upon her to notice that her husband trembled, as if he feared the impression he was producing or was about to produce, as much as or more than she. He drew nearer and took her hand again. "'I had this mask made at Venice,' he began in evident embarrassment. "'My darling Barbara, my dearest wife, do you think you will mind when I take it off? You will not dislike me, will you?' "'Oh, Edmund, of course I shall not mind,' said she. "'What has happened to you is our misfortune, but I am prepared for it.' "'Are you sure you are prepared?' "'Oh, yes. You are my husband.' "'You really feel quite confident that nothing external can affect you,' he said again, in a voice rendered uncertain by his agitation. "'I think I am. Quite,' she answered faintly. He bent his head. "'I hope, I hope you are,' he whispered. "'In the pause which followed, "'the ticking of the clock in the hall seemed to grow loud, "'and he turned a little aside to remove the mask. "'She breathlessly awaited the operation, "'which was one of some tediousness, "'watching him one moment, averting her face the next, 
and when it was done, she shut her eyes at the hideous spectacle that was revealed. A quick spasm of horror had passed through her, but though she quailed, she forced herself to regard him anew, repressing the cry that would naturally have escaped from her shy lips. Unable to look at him longer, Barbara sank down upon the floor beside her chair, covering her eyes. "'You cannot look at me,' he groaned in a helpless way. "'I am too terrible an object even for you to bear. I knew it, yet I hoped against it. Oh, this is a bitter fate. Curse the skill of those Viennese surgeons who saved me alive. Look up, Barbara,' he continued beseechingly. "'View me completely.' Say you loathe me if you do loathe me, and settle the case between us forever. His unhappy wife pulled herself together for a desperate strain. He was her Edmund. He had done her no wrong. He had suffered. A momentary devotion to him helped her, and lifting her eyes as bidden, she regarded this human remnant, this écorché, a second time. But the sight was too much. She again involuntarily looked aside and shuddered. "'Do you think you can get used to this?' he said. "'Yes or no? Can you bear such a thing of the charnel house near you? Judge for yourself, Barbara. Your Adonis, your matchless man, has come to this.' The poor lady stood beside him motionless, save for the restlessness of her eyes. All her natural sentiments of affection and pity were driven clean out of her by a sort of panic— and she had just the same sense of dismay and fearfulness that she would have had in the presence of an apparition. She could no how fancy this to be her chosen one, the man she had loved. He was metamorphosed to a specimen of another species. "'I do not loathe you,' she said with trembling. "'But I am so horrified, so overcome. Let me recover myself. "'Will you sup now? And while you do so I may go to my room to—' regain my old feeling for you. I will try if I may leave you a while. Yes, I will try. Without waiting for an answer from him, and keeping her gaze carefully averted, the frightened woman crept to the door and out of the room. She heard him sit down to the table, as if to begin supper, though heaven knows his appetite was slight enough after a reception which had confirmed his worst surmises. When Barbara had ascended the stairs and arrived in her chamber, she sank down and buried her face in the coverlet of the bed. Thus she remained for some time. The bedchamber was over the dining-room, and presently, as she knelt, Barbara heard Willows thrust back his chair and rise to go into the hall. In five minutes, that figure would probably come up the stairs and confront her again. It, this new and terrible form that was not her husband's, in the loneliness of this night, with neither maid nor friend beside her, she lost all self-control, and at the first sound of his footstep on the stairs, without so much as flinging a cloak round her, she flew from the room, ran along the gallery to the back staircase, which she descended, and unlocking the back door, let herself out. She scarcely was aware what she had done till she found herself in the greenhouse, crouching on a flower-stand. Here she remained, her great timid eyes strained through the glass upon the garden without, and her skirts gathered up, in fear of the field mice which sometimes came there. Every moment she dreaded to hear footsteps which she ought by law to have longed for, and a voice that should have been as music to her soul. But Edmund Willows came not that way. The nights were getting short at this season, and soon the dawn appeared, and the first rays of the sun— by daylight she had less to fear than in the dark. She thought she could meet him, and accustom herself to the spectacle. So the much-tried young woman unfastened the door of the hothouse, and went back by the way she had emerged a few hours ago. Her poor husband was probably in bed and asleep, his journey having been long, and she made as little noise as possible in her entry. The house was just as she had left it, and she looked about in the hall for his cloak and hat, but she could not see them, nor did she perceive the small trunk which had been all he had brought with him, his heavier baggage having been left at Southampton for the road wagon. She summoned courage to mount the stairs. The bedroom door was open as she had left it. She fearfully peeped round. The bed had not been pressed. Perhaps he had laid down on the dining-room sofa. She descended and entered. 
he was not there. On the table beside his unsoiled plate lay a note, hastily written on the leaf of a pocket-book. It was something like this. My ever-beloved wife, the effect that my forbidding appearance has produced upon you was one which I foresaw as quite possible. I hoped against it, but foolishly so. I was aware that no human love could survive such a catastrophe. I confess I thought yours divine. But after so long an absence, there could not be left sufficient warmth to overcome the too natural first aversion. It was an experiment, and it has failed. I do not blame you. Perhaps even it is better so. Goodbye. I leave England for one year. You will see me again at the expiration of that time if I live. Then I will ascertain your true feeling, and if it be against me, go away forever. E.W. On recovering from her surprise, Barbara's remorse was such that she felt herself absolutely unforgivable. She should have regarded him as an afflicted being, and not have been a slave to mere eyesight like a child. To follow him and entreat him to return was her first thought, but on making inquiries she found that nobody had seen him. He had silently disappeared. More than this, to undo the scene of last night was impossible. Her terror had been too plain, and he was a man unlikely to be coaxed back by her efforts to do her duty. She went and confessed to her parents all that had occurred, which indeed soon became known to more persons than those of her own family. The year passed, and he did not return, and it was doubted if he were alive. Barbara's contrition for her unconquerable repugnance was now such that she longed to build a church aisle or erect a monument and devote herself to deeds of charity for the remainder of her days. To that end she made inquiry of the excellent parson under whom she sat on Sundays, at a vertical distance of twenty feet. But he could only adjust his wig and tap his snuff-box, for such was the lukewarm state of religion in those days, that not an aisle, steeple, porch, east window, ten commandment board, lion and unicorn, or brass candlestick, was required anywhere at all in the neighbourhood as a votive offering from a distracted soul. The last century contrasting greatly in this respect with the happy times in which we live, when urgent appeals for contributions to such operations pour in by every morning's post, and nearly all churches have been made to look like new pennies. As the poor lady could not ease her conscience this way, she determined at least to be charitable, and soon had the satisfaction of finding her porch thronged every morning by the raggedest, idlest, most drunken, hypocritical, and worthless tramps in Christendom. But human hearts are as prone to change as the leaves of the creeper on the wall, and in the course of time, hearing nothing of her husband, Barbara could sit unmoved whilst her mother and friends said in her hearing, Well, what has happened is for the best. She began to think so herself, for even now she could not summon up that lopped and mutilated form without a shiver, though whenever her mind flew back to her early wedded days, and the man who had stood beside her then, a thrill of tenderness moved her, which if quickened by his living presence might have become strong. She was young and inexperienced, and had hardly on this late return grown out of the capricious fancies of girlhood. But he did not come again and she thought of his word that he would return once more if living, and how unlikely he was to break his word, she gave him up for dead. So did her parents, so also did another person, that man of silence, of irresistible incisiveness, of still countenance, who was as awake as seven sentinels when he seemed to be as sound asleep as the figures on his family monument. Lord Upland Towers, though not yet thirty, had chuckled like a caustic fogey of three score when he heard of Barbara's terror and flight at her husband's return and of the latter's prompt departure. He felt sure, however, that Willows, despite his hurt feelings, would have reappeared to claim his bright-eyed property if he had been alive at the end of the twelve months. As there was no husband to live with her, Barbara had relinquished the house prepared for them by her father, and taken up her abode anew at Sheen Manor, as in the days of her girlhood. By degrees the episode with Edmund Willows seemed to be a fevered dream, and as the months grew to years, Lord Upland Tower's friendship with the people at Sheen, 
which had somewhat cooled after Barbara's elopement, revived considerably, and he again became a frequent visitor there. He could not make the most trivial alteration or improvement at Nullingwood Hall, where he lived, without riding off to consult his friend Sir John at Cheen, and thus putting himself frequently under her eyes. Barbara grew accustomed to him, and talked to him as freely as to a brother. She even began to look up to him as a person of authority, judgment, and prudence, and though his severity on the bench towards poachers, smugglers, and turnip-stealers was a matter of common notoriety, she trusted that much of what was said might be misrepresentation. Thus they lived on till her husband's absence had stretched to years, and there could no longer be any doubt of his death. A passionless manner of renewing his address seemed no longer out of place in Lord Upland Towers. Barbara did not love him, but hers was essentially one of those sweet pea or with wind natures that require a twig of stouter fibre than its own to hang upon and bloom. Now, too, she was older, and admitted to herself that a man whose ancestor had run scores of Saracens through and through in fighting for the sight of the Holy Sepulchre was a more desirable husband, socially considered, than one who could only claim with certainty to know that his father and grandfather were respectable burgesses. Sir John took occasion to inform her that she might legally consider herself a widow, and in brief Lord Upland Towers carried his point with her, and she married him, though he never could get her to own that she loved him as she had loved Willows. In my childhood I knew an old lady whose mother saw the wedding, and she said that when Lord and Lady Upland Towers drove away from her father's house in the evening, it was a coach and four, and that my lady was dressed in green and silver, and wore the gayest hat and feather that ever were seen, though whether it was that the green did not suit her complexion, or otherwise, the countess looked pale, and the reverse of blooming. After their marriage her husband took her to London, and she saw the gaieties of a season there. Then they returned to Nollingwood Hall, and thus a year passed away. Before their marriage her husband had seemed to care but little about her inability to love him passionately. "'Only let me win you,' he had said, "'and I will submit to all that.' But now her lack of warmth seemed to irritate him and he conducted himself towards her with a resentfulness which led to her passing many hours with him in painful silence. The heir presumptive to the title was a remote relative, whom Lord Upland Towers did not exclude from the dislike he entertained towards many persons and things besides, and he had set his mind upon a lineal successor. He blamed her much that there was no promise of this, and asked her what she was good for. On a particular day in her gloomy life a letter— addressed to her as Mrs. Willows, reached Lady Upland Towers from an unexpected quarter. A sculptor in Pisa, knowing nothing of her second marriage, informed her that the long-delayed life-size statue of Mr. Willows, which, when her husband left that city, he had been directed to retain till it was sent for, was still in his studio. As his commission had not wholly been paid, and the statue was taking up room he could ill spare, he should be glad to have the debt cleared off, and directions for where to forward the figure. Arriving at a time when the Countess was beginning to have little secrets, of a harmless kind, it is true, from her husband, by reason of their growing estrangement, she replied to this letter without saying a word to Lord Upland Towers, sending off the balance that was owing to the sculptor, and telling him to dispatch the statue to her without delay. It was some weeks before it arrived at Nollingwood Hall, and by a singular coincidence, during the interval, she received the first absolutely conclusive tidings of her Edmund's death. It had taken place years before in a foreign land, about six months after their parting, and had been induced by the sufferings he had already undergone, coupled with much depression of spirit, which had caused him to succumb to a slight ailment. The news was sent to her in a brief and formal letter from some relative of Willows in another part of England. Her grief took the form of a passionate pity for his misfortunes, and of reproach to herself for never having been able to conquer her aversion to his latter image by recollection of what nature had originally made him. The sad spectacle that had gone from earth had never been her Edmund at all to her. Oh, that she could have met him as he was at first! Thus Barbara thought. It was only a few days later that a wagon with two horses containing an immense packing-case was seen at breakfast-time both by Barbara and her husband to drive round the back of the house, 
and by and by they were informed that a case labelled sculpture had arrived for her ladyship. "'What can that be?' said Lord Upland Towers. "'It is the statue of poor Edmund, which belongs to me, which had never been sent till now,' she answered. "'Where are you going to put it?' asked he. "'I have not decided,' said the Countess. "'Anywhere, so that it will not annoy you.' "'Oh, it won't annoy me,' says he. When it had been unpacked in a back room of the house, they went to examine it. The statue was a full-length figure in the purest Carrara marble, representing Edmund Willows in all his original beauty, as he had stood at parting from her when about to set out on his travels, a specimen of manhood almost perfect in every line and contour. The work had been carried out with absolute fidelity. A Phoebus Apollo, sure, said the Earl of Upland Towers, who had never seen Willows, real or represented, till now. Barbara did not hear him. She was standing in a sort of trance before the first husband, as if she had no conscience of the other husband at her side. The mutilated features of Willows had disappeared from her mind's eye. This perfect being was really the man she had loved, not the latter pitiable figure, in whom love and truth should have seen this image always, but had not done so. It was not till Lord Upland Towers said roughly, "'Are you going to stay here all morning worshipping him?' that she roused herself. Her husband had not till now the least suspicion that Edmund Willows originally looked thus, and he thought how deep would have been his jealousy years ago if Willows had been known to him. Returning to the hall in the afternoon, he found his wife in the gallery, whither the statue had been brought. She was lost in reverie before it, just as in the morning. "'What are you doing?' he asked. She started and turned. "'I am looking at my hus my statue, to see if it is well done,' she stammered. "'Why should I not?' "'There's no reason why,' he said. "'What are you going to do with that monstrous thing? It can't stand here forever.' "'I don't wish it,' she said. "'I'll find a place.' In her boudoir there was a deep recess, and while the Earl was absent from home for a few days the following week, she hired joiners from the village, who under her directions enclosed the recess with a panelled door. Into the tabernacle thus formed she had the statue placed, fastening the door with a lock, the key of which she kept in her pocket. When her husband returned he missed the statue from the gallery, and concluding that it had been put away out of deference to his feelings, made no remark. Yet at moments he noticed something on his lady's face which he had never noticed there before. He could not construe it. It was a sort of silent ecstasy, a reserved beatification. What had become of the statue he could not divine, and growing more and more curious, looked here and there for it until, thinking of her private room, he went towards that spot. After knocking, he heard the shutting of a door and the click of a key, but when he entered his wife was sitting at work, on what was in those days called knotting. Lord Upland Tower's eye fell upon the newly painted door where the recess had formerly been. "'You have been carpentering in my absence, then, Barbara,' he said carelessly. "'Yes, Upland Towers. "'Why did you go putting up such a tasteless enclosure as that, spoiling the handsome arch of the alcove?' "'I wanted more closet room, and I thought as this was my own apartment. "'Of course,' he returned. "'Lord Upland Towers knew now where the statue of young Willows was.' One night, or rather in the smallest hours of the morning, he missed the Countess from his side. Not being a man of nervous imaginings, he fell asleep again before he had much considered the matter, and the next morning had forgotten the incident. But a few nights later the same circumstances occurred. This time he fully roused himself, but before he had moved to search for her, she entered the chamber in her dressing-gown, carrying a candle, which she extinguished as she approached, deeming him asleep. He could discover from her breathing that she was strangely moved, but not on this occasion either did he reveal that he had seen her. Presently, when she had lain down, affecting to wake, he asked her some trivial questions. "'Yes, Edmund,' she replied absently. Lord Upland Towers became convinced that she was in the habit of leaving the chamber in this queer way more frequently than he had observed, and he determined to watch." The next midnight he feigned deep sleep, and shortly after perceived her stealthily rise and let herself out of the room in the dark. 
he slipped on some clothing and followed. At the farther end of the corridor, where the clash of flint and steel would be out of the hearing of one in the bedchamber, she struck a light. He stepped aside into an empty room till she had lit a taper and passed on to her boudoir. In a minute or two he followed. Arrived at the door of the boudoir, he beheld the door of the private recess open, and Barbara within it, standing with her arms clasped tightly round the neck of her Edmund, and her mouth on his. The shawl which she had thrown round her nightclothes had slipped from her shoulders, and her long white robe and pale face lent her the blanched appearance of a second statue embracing the first. Between her kisses she apostrophized in a low murmur of infantine tenderness, "'My only love, how could I be so cruel to you, my perfect one, so good and true?' I am ever faithful to you, despite my seeming infidelity. I always think of you, dream of you, during the long hours of the day and in the night watches. O oh, Edmund, I am always yours. Such words as these, intermingled with sobs and streaming tears and dishevelled hair, testified to an intensity of feeling in his wife which Lord Upland Towers had not dreamed of her possessing. Ha ha, says he to himself. This is where we evaporate. This is where my hopes of a successor in the title dissolve. Ha ha! This must be seen to, verily. Lord Upland Towers was a subtle man once he set himself to strategy, though in the present instance he never thought of the simple stratagem of constant tenderness. Nor did he enter the room and surprise his wife as a blunderer would have done, but went back to his chamber as silently as he had left it. When the Countess returned thither, Shaken by spent sobs and sighs, shaken by spent sobs and sighs, he appeared to be soundly sleeping as usual. The next day he began his counter moves by making inquiries as to the whereabouts of the tutor who had travelled with his wife's first husband. This gentleman he found was now master of a grammar school at no great distance from Nollingwood. At the first convenient moment, Lord Upland Towers went thither and obtained an interview with the said gentleman. The schoolmaster was much gratified by a visit from such an influential neighbour, and was ready to communicate anything that his lordship desired to know. After some general conversation on the school and its progress, the visitor observed that he believed the schoolmaster had once travelled a good deal with the unfortunate Mr. Willows, and had been with him on the occasion of his accident. He, Lord Upland Towers, was interested in knowing what had really happened at that time, and had often thought of inquiring. And then the Earl not only heard by word of mouth as much as he wished to know, but the chat becoming more intimate, the schoolmaster drew upon paper a sketch of the disfigured head, explaining with bated breath various details in the representation. "'It was very strange and terrible,' said Lord Upland Towers, taking the sketch in his hand. "'Neither nose nor ears. A poor man in the town nearest to Nollingwood Hall, who combined the art of sign-painting with ingenious mechanical occupations, was sent for by Lord Upland Towers to come to the hall on a day in that week when the Countess had gone on a short visit to her parents. His employer made the man understand that the business in which his assistance was demanded was to be considered private, and money ensured the observance of this request. The lock of the cupboard was picked, and the ingenious mechanic and painter, assisted by the schoolmaster's sketch, which Lord Upland Towers had put in his pocket, set to work upon the godlike countenance of the statue under my lord's direction. What the fire had maimed in the original, the chisel maimed in the copy. It was a fiendish disfigurement, ruthlessly carried out, and was rendered still more shocking by being tinted to the hues of life, as life had been after the wreck. Six hours after, when the workman was gone, Lord Upland Towers looked upon the result, and smiled grimly, and said, "'A statue should represent a man as he appeared in life, and that's as he appeared. But tis done to good purpose, and not idly.' He locked the door of the closet with a skeleton key, and went his way to fetch the Countess home. That night she slept, but he kept awake. According to the tale, she murmured soft words in her dream, and he knew that the tender converse of her imaginings was held with the one whom he had supplanted, but in name. At the end of her dream the Countess of Upland Towers awoke and rose, and then the enactment of former nights was repeated. Her husband remained still and listened. 
Two strokes sounded from the clock on the pediment without, when, leaving the chamber door ajar, she passed along the corridor to the other end, where, as usual, she obtained a light. So deep was the silence that he could even from his bed hear her softly blowing the tinder to a glow after striking the steel. She moved on into the boudoir, and he heard, or fancied he heard, the turning of the key in the closet door. The next moment there came from that direction a loud and prolonged shriek, which resounded to the farthest corners of the house. It was repeated, and there was the noise of a heavy fall. Lord Upland Tower sprang out of bed. He hastened along the dark corridor to the door of the boudoir, which stood ajar, and by the light of the candle within saw his poor young countess lying in a heap in her nightdress on the floor of the closet. When he reached her side, he found that she had fainted, much to the relief of his fears that matters were worse. He quickly shut up and locked in the hated image which had done the mischief, and lifted his wife in his arms, where in a few instants she opened her eyes. Pressing her face to his without saying a word, he carried her back to her room, endeavouring as he went to disperse her terrors by a laugh in her ear, oddly compounded of causticity, predilection, and brutality. "'Ho, ho, ho,' says he. "'Frightened, dear one, hey? What a baby tis. Only a joke, sure, Barbara, a splendid joke. But a baby should not go to closets at midnight to look for the ghost of the dear departed. If it do, it must expect to be terrified at its aspect.' When she was in her bedchamber, and had quite come to herself, though her nerves were still much shaken, he spoke to her more sternly. "'Now, my lady, answer me. Do you love him, eh?' "'No, no,' she faltered, shuddering, with her expanded eyes fixed on her husband. "'He is too terrible. No, no.' "'Are you sure?' "'Quite sure,' replied the broken-spirited countess. But her natural elasticity asserted itself. Next morning he inquired of her again, "'Do you love him now?' She quailed under his gaze, but did not reply. "'That means that you do still by G,' he continued. "'It means I will not tell an untruth, and I do not wish to incense my lord,' she answered with dignity. "'Then suppose we go and have another look at him?' As he spoke, he suddenly took her by the wrist and turned as if to lead her towards the ghastly closet— "'No, no, oh, no!' she cried, and her desperate wriggle out of his hand revealed that the fright of the night had left more impression upon her delicate soul than superficially appeared. "'Another dose or two, and she will be cured,' he said to himself. It was now so generally known that the Earl and the Countess were not in accord, that he took no great trouble to disguise his deeds in relation to this matter." During the day he ordered four men with ropes and rollers to attend to him in the boudoir. During the day he ordered four men with ropes and rollers to attend him in the boudoir. When they arrived the closet was open, and the upper part of the statue tied up in canvas. He had it taken to the sleeping chamber. What followed is more or less matter of conjecture. The story, as told to me, goes on to say, when Lady Upland Towers retired with him that night, she saw near the foot of the heavy oak four-poster a tall dark wardrobe, which had not stood there before, but she did not ask what its presence meant. "'I have a little whim,' he explained when they were in the dark. "'Have you?' says she. "'To erect a little shrine, as it may be called. "'A little shrine? "'Yes, to one whom we both equally adore, eh? "'I'll show you what it contains.' He pulled a cord which hung covered by the bed curtains, and the doors of the wardrobe slowly opened, disclosing that the shelves within had been removed throughout, and the interior adapted to receive the ghastly figure, which stood as it had stood in the boudoir, but with a wax candle burning on each side of it to throw the cropped and distorted features into relief. She clutched him, uttered a low scream, and buried her head in the bedclothes. "'Oh, take it away! Please take it away!' she implored. "'All in good time, namely, when you love me best,' he returned calmly. "'You don't quite yet, eh?' "'I don't know. I think—oh, Upland Towers, have mercy. I cannot bear it. Oh, in pity, take it away.' "'Nonsense. One gets accustomed to anything. Take another gaze.' 
In short, he allowed the doors to remain unclosed at the foot of the bed, and the wax tapers burning, and such was the strange fascination of the grisly exhibition that a morbid curiosity took possession of the countess as she lay, and at his repeated request, she did again look out from the coverlet, shuddered, hid her eyes, and looked again, all the while begging him to take it away, or it would drive her out of her senses. But he would not do so as yet, and the wardrobe was not locked till dawn. The scene was repeated the next night. Firm in enforcing his ferocious correctives, he continued the treatment till the nerves of the poor lady were quivering in agony under the virtuous tortures inflicted by her lord, to bring her truant heart back to faithfulness. The third night, when the scene had opened as usual, she lay staring with immense wild eyes at the horrid fascination. On a sudden she gave an unnatural laugh. She laughed more and more, staring at the image, till she literally shrieked with laughter. Then there was silence, and he found her to have become insensible. He thought she had fainted, but soon saw that the event was worse. She was in an epileptic fit. He started up, dismayed by the sense that, like many other subtle personages, he had been too exacting for his own interests. Such love as he was capable of, though rather a selfish gloating than a cherishing solicitude, was fanned into life on the instant. He closed the wardrobe with the pulley, clasped her in his arms, took her gently to the window, and did all he could to restore her. It was a long time before the countess came to herself, and when she did so a considerable change seemed to have taken place in her emotions. She flung her arms around him, and with gasps of fear abjectly kissed him many times, at last bursting into tears. She had never wept in this scene before. "'You'll take it away, dearest, you will,' she begged, pe she begged plaintively. "'If you love me.' "'I do, oh, I do.' "'And hate him, and his memory?' "'Yes, yes.' "'Thoroughly.' "'I cannot endure recollection of him,' cried the poor countess slavishly. "'It fills me with shame. How could I ever be so depraved? I'll never behave badly again, Upland Towers.' and you will never put the hated statue again before my eyes? He felt that he could promise with perfect safety. Never, said he. Then I'll love you, she retumed eagerly, as if dreading lest the scourge should be applied anew. And I'll never, never dream of thinking a single thought that seems like faithlessness to my marriage vow. The strange thing now was that the fictitious love wrung from her by terror took on, through mere habit of enactment, a certain quality of reality. A servile mood of attachment to the earl became distinctly visible in her contemporaneously with the actual dislike of her late husband's memory. The mood of attachment grew and continued when the statue was removed. A permanent revulsion was operant in her, which intensified as time wore on. How fright could have effected such a change of idiosyncrasy, learned physicians alone can say. But I believe such cases of reactionary instinct are not unknown. The upshot was that the cure became so permanent as to be itself a new disease. She clung to him so tightly that she would not willingly be out of his sight for a moment. She would have no sitting-room apart from his, though she could not help starting when he entered suddenly to her. Her eyes were well-nigh always fixed upon him. If he drove out, she wished to go with him. His slightest civilities to other women made her frantically jealous, till at length her very fidelity became a burden to him, absorbing his time and curtailing his liberty, and causing him to curse and swear. If he ever spoke sharply to her now, she did not revenge herself by flying off into a mental world of her own. All that affection for another— which had provided her with a resource, was now a cold black cinder. From that time the life of this scarred and enervated lady, whose existence might have been developed to so much higher purpose but for the ignoble ambition of her parents and the conventions of the time, was one of obsequious amativeness towards a perverse and cruel man. Little personal events came to her in quick succession. Half a dozen, eight, nine, ten such events— in brief, she bore him no less than eleven children in the eight following years, but half of them came prematurely into the world, or died a few days old. Only one, a girl, attained to maturity. 
She, in after years, became the wife of the Honourable Mr. Beltonley, who was created Lord Dalmain, as may be remembered. There was no living son and heir. At length, completely worn out in mind and body, Lady Upland Towers was taken abroad by her husband to try the effect of a more genial climate upon her wasted frame. But nothing availed to strengthen her, and she died at Florence, a few months after her arrival in Italy. Contrary to expectation, the Earl of Upland Towers did not marry again. Such affection as existed in him, strange, hard, brutal as it was, seemed untransferable, and the title, as is known, passed at his death to his nephew. Perhaps it may not be so generally known that during the enlargement of the hall for the sixth earl, while digging in the grounds for the new foundations, the broken fragments of a marble statue were unearthed. They were submitted to various antiquaries, who said that, so far as the damaged pieces would allow them to form an opinion, the statue seemed to be that of a mutilated Roman satyr, or, if not, an allegorical figure of death. Only one or two inhabitants guessed whose statue those fragments had composed. I should have added that shortly after the death of the Countess, an excellent sermon was preached by the Dean of Melchester, the subject of which, though names were not mentioned, was unquestionably suggested by the aforesaid events. He dwelt upon the folly of indulgence in sensuous love for a handsome form merely, and showed that the only rational and virtuous growths out of that affection were those based upon intrinsic worth. In the case of the tender but somewhat shallow lady whose life I have related, there is no doubt that an infatuation for the person of young Willows was the chief feeling that induced her to marry him, which was the more deplorable in that his beauty, by all tradition, was the least of his recommendations, every report bearing out the inference that he must have been a man of steadfast nature, bright intelligence, and promising life. The company thanked the old surgeon for his story, which the rural dean declared to be a far more striking one than any he could hope to tell. An elderly member of the club, who was mostly called the bookworm, said that a woman's natural instinct of fidelity would indeed send back her heart to a man after his death in a truly wonderful manner sometimes, if anything occurred to put before her forcibly the original affection between them, and his original aspect in her eyes, whatever his inferiority may have been, social or otherwise, and a general conversation ensued upon the power that a woman has of seeing the actual in the representation, the reality in the dream, a power which, according to the sentimental member, men have no faculty of equaling. The rural dean thought that such cases as that related by the surgeon were rather an illustration of passion electrified back to life than of a latent true affection. The story had suggested that he should try to recount to them one which he used to hear in his youth, and which afforded an instance of the latter and better kind of feeling, his heroine also being a lady who had married beneath her, though he feared his narrative would be of a much slighter kind than the surgeon's. The club begged him to proceed, and the parson began. End of chapter 2, part 2